Yeah, go ahead, please, uh, Gabriel. Okay. Um, uh, welcome, everybody, to this uh, tutorial session on reinforcement learning and optimal control and decision theory. Um, I'm Gabriel Bernier Colborn from the NRSC, if uh, you don't know me. Um, this tutorial is in two parts, so we'll be taking a break in about an hour uh, for 15 minutes, and then we'll reconvene for the second part of the tutorial. Um, if you have any questions, uh, I think it's best that we use the chat feature in the Zoom, uh, or you can use the Slack channel, and we have uh, volunteers that will be relaying the questions to me, and I will uh, ask the questions to, uh, to Pierre-Luc. Uh, you can also raise your hand in the uh, in the Zoom, uh, and Xiaodan will be uh, fielding those questions. Uh, so you might be able to unmute yourself and ask your question yourself. Uh, but you can, I think the chat the chat function in, in Zoom is the, the easiest. Um, we'll be taking time. Uh, well, I don't know how how Pierre Luc feels about this, but um, we thought we might keep the questions for the end of each half. Um, but Pierre Luc, if you if you want to take more regular breaks to field questions, that's that's up to you. If, if that's okay with you. Yeah, I'm okay with that. Uh, I think okay. uh, the only thing is if anyone is asking question on the chat, yeah, uh, I may not be able to see it. So perhaps Gabriel. Yes. Better. So uh, the questions that are posed in the chat, I will uh, I will ask to you. Uh, okay. Same for Slack and uh, Shaodan will be fielding people who raise their hands if they want to. Um, this, uh, so I'd like to welcome our presenter. Uh, we haven't spoken before, so I don't know if we pronounce your last name Bacon or Bacon? Bacon uh, in French. Okay. Uh, so uh, this is Pierre-Luc Bacon from the Université de Montréal. Um, Pierre-Luc Bacon is an assistant professor at uh, University of Montreal's uh, Department of um, Computer Science and Operational Research. Um, he's also a member of MILA uh, and IVADO at the University of Montreal. And he also holds a Facebook CIFAR, CIFAR AI chair. Uh, he obtained his PhD at McGill and uh, did a postdoc at Stanford. And his research is um, mainly focused on uh, the problem of learning to take decisions over long time spans and its ramifications in optimization and representation learning. Uh, so Pierre-Luc, we're uh, very happy to, to host you and that you took the time to do this tutorial. So uh, if you're ready, you can take it away. Sounds good, thank you. So um, today, the, um, the tutorial, I, I was trying to give you a sense of where, where reinforcement learning comes. And, and the thing about reinforcement learning is that it's, uh, it's inherently a multidisciplinary effort. And so in order to understand to, and to better appreciate um, how the algorithms came to be, it's, it's important to realize that people uh, sometimes have different goals. Uh, which uh, shape the kind of solutions that they, um, that they end up uh, finding. And so uh, to me, like reinforcement learning is really the intersection of these three main fields, but um, it goes uh, also way beyond and into different sub-communities. But the kind of reinforcement learning that you would learn about in a textbook like Introduction to Reinforcement Learning is, is more inspired by the AI and uh, computer science community as well as people in, um, in neuroscience. So it's that circle up there. But of course, a lot of the tools and a lot of the foundations from, uh, from uh, the theory of reinforcement learning actually comes from optimal control, as well as in uh, operations research. And interestingly, some of these tools have been developed and rediscovered independently. And there's also been some useful um, collaboration across fields, which led to, to, to new uh, applications in, uh, in each of these fields. So to give you like a really big picture of what these three fields are, uh, I thought that it would be a good idea to, to summarize a little bit what's going on, but this is really a big picture. So, so I know that if you're uh, a researcher in any of these fields, you might disagree with that big characterization, but of course it's just meant to give you uh, uh, the big picture here. And so in reinforcement learning, as saying it's much more of a tradition rooted in AI uh, Cogside neuroscience, and it's really uh, about learning to act optimally. But the key word here is from interaction. So if you read the textbook by Intro to RL by Rich Shatin, there's going to be a lot of emphasis put on that word interaction and experience. So it's that interactive process between uh, a decision maker and its environment, which, which really uh, is key here and, and, and learning from experience. So in that sense, reinforcement learning is much more of a problem statement than 
it is a particular technique or uh, algorithm, of course. So because of uh, where uh, uh, RL comes from in AI, uh, and because a lot of researchers have been attracted to AI with uh, ideas such as um, such as that, as AGI coming up with with uh, AI that works in, on, on, in, in pretty much uh, all, all circumstances, uh, typically uh, uh, reinforcement learning uh, tools, algorithms, and problem formulation assume very minimal problem structure, and it's meant to be that way because typically that black box nature is is deemed uh, to be a desirable thing. Now, in uh, contrast, in optimal control, this is more of a tradition rooted in engineering uh, communities uh, where it's much more about trajectory optimization in nonlinear dynamical system. So uh, by when we talk about nonlinear non dynamical system, uh, it is naturally a concept which, uh, which, which co comes from a uh, continuous time formulation. And so a lot of the applications in optimal control are concerned with things like air, aircraft, um, spacecraft, control, spacecraft control, robots. Um, it's been used a bunch in uh, all sorts of chemical process engineering, optimization, and economics, epidemiology, so on and so forth. So all these applications, they, they tend to be modeled as deterministic nonlinear dynamical system. But of course, there, there are more uh, uh, frameworks that have been used as well. And uh, in optimal control, typically we tend to embrace a little bit more the problem structure. It's a bit more analytical. Um, in the same way, in operation, operations research, um, there's also uh, more of a tradition of leveraging the problem structure to get the best solution possible for the, the given problem. And um, in OR, the difference is that um, it's, it's been often concerned with um, problems such as supply chain management, uh, policy modeling, transportation problems. So, so it gives it gives slightly a uh, slightly different flavor to the algorithms and uh, thought process uh, when you read textbooks from that community. But the beautiful thing is that all these fields actually share the same tools and um, uh, they share the same mathematical foundation. And um, and um, hopefully um, I'll convince you today that's uh, that it's a cool thing and that you should be uh, looking across different fields to, to come up with new tools and new insights. And so this is a picture that you would have seen probably many times in um, a textbook on intro to RL, but it's good to, 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 to show again here, but with slightly different terminology that kind of uh, spans uh, across uh, different fields. And so uh, at the top of that picture, we have um, an agent, where uh, agent is a term which we uh, use more commonly in RL, whereas in optimal control, we'd usually talk about a controller and then that controller, that agent interacts with uh, an environment or a dynamic, dynamic system through some uh, action or control. And so these actions can be uh, discrete or continuous, but uh, these, uh, what they do is they, that they affect, they affect the evolution of the dynamical system. And that environment in turn um, uh, produces new states and uh, outputs a reward or cost. So typically in reinforcement learning, we're concerned with maximizing some notion of a reward rather than optimal control. Uh, it's often more uh, in terms of, uh, uh, of cost. So the basic framework for many of these, uh, well, for reinforcement learning in, in, in operations research is that of Markov decision processes um, which is a formalism that uh, was mostly developed in the 50s, starting from uh, Bellman, uh, Richard Bellman. And so an MDP allows us to, to, to formalize this, this agent interaction loop over there. And so it consists of a set of states, a notion of states, which uh, state is, is uh, the thing that allows you to, to uh, to express the evolution of the system. So it's all the information necessary to characterize the evolution of the system. And um, equipped with this, we also have a notion of action, which is the mean by which we, we influence the uh, trajectory of the system. And uh, how that action uh, influences the system is described in terms of a transition probability function. And uh, finally, the last component is that of a reward function which importantly, uh, and I highlighted this here, uh, 
the reward function is an immediate quantity that quantifies the, the goodness of an action that uh, the system takes in a given state. And immediate is really important here because we're not going to be optimizing for just a reward, but some function of the reward. And then uh, you can mix and match and add other dimensions to that problem formulation. So you can have uh, discrete or continuous time, uh, discrete or continuous state, discrete or continuous actions. And you can have as well a finite or infinite horizons. So the horizon would be the number of steps over which you want to be taking decisions. Uh, so most of time in RL, however, um, it's, it's cast in the discrete time setting, but uh, there are formalism as well for dealing with continuous time, which have mostly been used though in, uh, in operations research. The continuous time formulation though is pretty uh, standard in uh, optimal control. So the, the goal that we're going to be pursuing is that of finding a policy, which is a, a way of choosing action in a given state so as to maximize a uh, given performance measure. And this performance measure, you can think of it as uh, some sort of loss if we were to be in a supervised learning setting. Now, the thing is that we're not really going to be able to, to, to just swap uh, a loss for another the way that it's relatively easy to do in, let's say, a deep learning uh, setting where you just choose your loss and then uh, the same algorithm hold. Here, uh, the, the theory is going to be uh, fundamentally affected by the uh, assumptions that you make on that loss, so the, the performance measure. So there are a bunch of uh, criteria that are, that are defined, that have been studied in the operations research uh, literature. So oftentimes, we deal with the total expected reward, the expected total discounted reward, average reward, and a bunch of other criteria that are a bit weirder. But most of the time in RL, uh, we deal with the, with the expected total discounted reward. <clears throat> so I think here I have a, a, a little demo. In fact, I should have shared with you. Um, so I'm going to just switch uh, screen. Let me see if I can do that. Can you see this here? So this is a Google Collab. Um, and this was just a little demonstration to, to kind of highlight uh, what this uh, agent interaction lo looks like in practice. So if I can just, just run this thing here, I think I'm going to have to open it here. So I think I'm going to have to switch the count. Okay, I think we're back. Can you see this? Yes, we see well. Yeah, sounds good. It should work, I guess. Now, while the virtual machine is starting, I'm just going to go back to my slide. So this agent interaction loop, the picture that we had a couple of slides ago, uh, really describe a process by which we're going to be generating and sample states and, and actions. So the way it works is that we're going to start from an initial state. From that state, we're going to be sampling some actions according to our policy. So I'm making some assumptions, by the way, on the kind of policies we're making here. I'm going to go back to this uh, point in a few slides. But for now, we think of that policy simply as a conditional distribution of our uh, actions, condition on the current state. And given that action, we can then compute the next reward. In this case, I'm assuming that it's a deterministic reward, but it's perfectly fine as well if you deal with um, a distribution of our rewards. Uh, the framework uh, is not going to be affected by that. But for simplicity, without loss of generality, we just assume that we have a deterministic mapping that takes a state in action and then outputs a new report. And then given the choice of actions that our agent uh, picked, we can compute uh, the next state by sampling according to a transition probability function. And then we repeat this, uh, these four steps uh, for a fixed horizon T or uh, for, uh, for infinity. And uh, that process will uh, generate what we call trajectories. So this is how we induce some uh, samples from the interaction of a policy with, uh, with its environment. <clears throat> 
So let's go back to the uh, collab here, just to highlight how these things work. So I'm going to be using a small uh, synthetic example here. If you're interested, you can read the corresponding paper. It's a very uh, interesting paper, but it's it's just chosen because it's, it's small. It has two states, two actions, and we're just going to be playing with it. And so I uh, create this environment. And note that this transition uh, probability matrix function here has the property that when I sum over, let's say, the next state, I condition on a state in an action, and then I sum over the next state, this sh should sum up to 1. So this is a stochastic matrix, and that's what we're, we're verifying here in that cell. Now, um, the, the interaction loop protocol, in a way, is, is expressed in this, this uh, function here, which I wrote. It's a small uh, generator in Python. So I have an initial uh, distribution of a state. I pick my first state, and I feed that into my policy, which is a conditional probability distribution over an next action. Everything is discrete here, so it's a categorical distribution. And then I can already output the next state, the next action, and then uh, we repeat. So then I can do this, and here it's written as a generator, so I can generate samples uh, in an infinite number of times. And so this is what I'm doing here with this uh, function uh, called uh, take sample. And um, uh, let's see what it looks like here. So I've sampled a trajectory here of length of 10, and this would be the sequence of rewards that I'm getting. And uh, let me just switch again, go back to my, my slides. And remember that uh, what we're interested in uh, ultimately is to maximize some, some notion uh, associated with the reward uh, that uh, our policy um, is going to induce in our process. And so we have trajectories here, and then we have corresponding rewards. So what do we do now? Well, we need to define that very important quantity, which we call the return. And I think this is something that if you're new to RL, it's very good that early on you um, you try to disintegrate your terminology and really distinguish between reward and return. These things are very different. So the return is a function of the reward, and it's uh, in our case, it's always it's always additive, and it's a sum it's a sum of the the rewards. So this is what we have up here. So we can take a simple sum like this, but we can also discount each of the individual re reward. And why would you do that? Well, a couple of ways, a couple of reasons. There's a, a modeling reason, first of all, that uh, it's some, in some cases it might, might make sense to model uh, the effect of rewards in a discounted fashion to basically express the fact that uh, perhaps uh, you care mo more about the present than the future. So this is what would happen if you set, let's say, gamma to discount factor to zero, then in that case, Basically, you're completely myopic, and all you care about would be uh, to maximize the current uh, reward because all the other terms of an error will, will just disappear. Then, the, um, in the same way, if we set gamma is equal to one, then it means that we pretty much care about all the rewards in that trajectory. So, this is the interpretation in terms of discounting. But there's another really interesting and, and useful interpretation in terms of a random horizon. So you can think of gamma also as, 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 a, as defining a random horizon. So it's as if you weren't too sure about where the, the final time would be in your process. And you want to model that uh, where t is now a random variable, specifically a random variable which is uh, geometrically distributed. So it's as if at every step you were to flip a coin, and if it if it returns uh, true, then you keep on sampling. If it returns false, then you terminate your your sampling process. So mathematically, these two views are are equivalent. Um, and just to make this more concrete a little bit, let's go back to our, to the, the our notebook. And so. What we're doing here is simply uh, I've defined a little widget here. Let's say we have a, a, a sequence of rewards. This is completely synthetic. I've just said let's let's imagine we have one, two, three as, as rewards, and we say what would be um, the return if our discount factor is one? Well, it's easy. It's just a sum of them. So this is what we see here. Our slider is at one, and then the rewards are one, two, three. The discounts are all one for all of them. And so, uh, so the discount return is just a sum. So it's one plus two, three plus three, six. 
And same thing if we set this count to zero. Now this time, the only thing that we have, all the other terms uh, go to zero and then we're left with a return of one. And then in between, we have intermediary values. So we go from, from one to, to basically all the, the sum of it. So this is a return from t is equal to zero, so starting from one. But interestingly, there's, there's a recursive structure here. So the return also uh, at time one can be related to the return at time zero. And just to get a sense of how that works, let's once again set the discount factor to one, in that case, to the sum of two and three. So this means that the discount return is five. Maybe I, I can zoom a little bit more here in case you don't see well on the stream. And then same thing, discount factor to zero, then you know it's only uh, the first term. And, if, and then finally, let's just continue our exercise and do that at t is equal to two. So it means that now the only reward term that we take into account is the last term. This is three. So of course, if this count is one, then the sum is, is, is three. And in that case, also if we set gamma to zero, then it's also three because it's only one term. So now you might have kind of guessed that what's going on here is that uh, if let's say things were to be discounted, uh, undiscounted, so t, uh, gamma is equal to one, then what we've done uh, in these steps, let's put the sliders back to one in all, in all cases here. So what we've done essentially is to compute, we have, look, we have here six, five, and three. So what's going on here, we're basically computing the cumulative sum, right? So now you might wonder what's, what's the equivalent uh, concept when we introduce discounting? What's the equivalent of that cumulative sum when there's discounting? Well, turns out you can express these things in terms of convolution. Um, now I'm not gonna go into details of this, but I thought it'd be cool to mention because um, these are the kind of things that you might be useful when you uh, implement these uh, reinforcement learning algorithms in, uh, in uh, some uh, automatic differentiation, differentiation frameworks, such as uh, TensorFlow or PyTorch or you name it, anything like this, where you really want to avoid uh, having to code up like a for loop. So it is also possible to view this as a, a specific convolution, uh, a choice of convolution. And this is just to convince you that uh, it's true here, uh, but I'm not going to go more into details of this. All right, so let's go back to the slides. All right, so this is the return, but um, the return is a random variable. And when we're going to be maximized, when we're going to be interested in finding uh, optimal policies and working with, uh, with the return, we're, we're going to be working with its expectation. And so uh, the expected return uh, is, uh, is going to be uh, summarized into a, a function that we call the value function. This is what I write right here, uh, v pi of s. So v pi is the expectation of the return, the condition on the, on the state. So it means that if you were to start your system in state s and run your system forward for, let's say, t, t time step or to infinity, and then compute the return, then um, this gives you the expectation, the expected return. And then it might be uh, more obvious now as well as to the kind of restrictions we might wanna put on, on the discount factor. So imagine if we're in the uh, infinite horizon case here, that uh, trajectory is gonna be very long. And of course, uh, if, um, if we want things to be bounded, we're gonna want our discount factor to be strictly smaller than one so that we get a uh, bounded expected return as well. So the problem of uh, finding the expected return associated with the policy in every possible start state is called the policy evaluation. And it's a very fundamental uh, step to derive also other algorithms. But that policy evaluation problem uh, is inherently a uh, linear problem. It can be viewed as, uh, as a solving a linear system of equation. And so in closed form, you can compute this value function here as a solution to identity minus gamma T pi inverse times R pi. And these matrices, I define them uh, just below in that slide. So P pi is a matrix of number states by number states, where the, let's say the, you pick a row, this is a, your source state, and then the column is gonna be your destination state. So if you sum over columns, that should sum up to one. So this is just averaging, um, this is just marginalizing out the choice of action so that we go from this, uh, let's say, non multi-dimensional array uh, 
if we were to think in terms of NumPy, let's say, uh, to a, uh, a matrix. And then same goes with RPy, so we're just averaging out the actions so that we have a vector now. So this is just a linear system of equations. So we can pull this up. And, and uh, it's very much like what we have in the map here. So um, we form the PPy matrix, RPy matrix, and then we solve it. And uh, just a um, little tip here, I think that it's very cool to use this um, Einstein summation function. If you're not familiar with that, I highly encourage you to, to take a look. It's a very neat way to express some, what would be a messier computation that you have to express in NumPy. But here, this is essentially just computing that marginalization over there that we had on the, on the previous slide. So you see, like it's three lines and then bam, we have exactly the, the, the true solution to the, the value function of our problem. We can test it here. There's not much to gain from like the specific values that are found here. It's just announced uh, these values, um, but just to show you how simple that can be done. And then here internally, the, the solver in, uh, in, in uh, NumPy, I think is using something like Gaussian elimination. So it's a direct method. Right, so this is a, the problem of policy evaluation, but ultimately we, we're really interested in finding good policies, so good ways of acting, where good is of course uh, defined with respect to the performance measure that you've, you've chosen. But for now, today in this tutorial, we're just gonna be assuming the expected discounted return, which is the most common one used in reinforcement learning. And to be honest, I think this is probably for two reasons. Um, First reason is that it comes with some simplification on the theory side, so it's much easier to use. And second reason might be also historical. We just started using it and now uh, we're kind of stuck with it. Um, but yeah, we're gonna be using expected return, but it's good to know, expected discount return, but it's good to know that other criteria also exist in case it might be a better choice for you to model your problem uh, in, in, in a different way. So the problem we, we're interested in here is finding that optimal policy. And that notion of optimal policy is defined with respect to its value function. So this is how we're gonna compare uh, our policies with each other. We need to be able to say like, which one is better than another one. And so that's why we're interested in finding a value of a policy. So this is what we have here where we're maximized with a set of po all possible policies. And then we're picking V star is the optimal value function. It's the one that is the highest according to a partial order of these value functions and that partial order is component wise. So it means that um, uh, the V uh, star is the vector with the property that in each of its components, it's strictly, it's greater or equal than, than any other vector uh, in that set. So of course that set of policies, big pi can be very large. And so we might wanna be a bit smarter in terms of how we solve that problem. We uh, specifically don't want to enumerate all policies um, and um, so we're gonna have two ways of do, uh, dealing with this. So the problem is that we're gonna, the, the, the first uh, tool that we're gonna use is that we're gonna leverage problem structure a little bit. And that's why the uh, discounted case is so, the infinite discounted case is so useful is that we can show uh, without loss of optimality that it's okay to just consider stationary deterministic policies. So what that means, a stationary policy is, is a policy which, um, which has no dependence on, on the current time step. And so that is, that is already pretty, pretty uh, useful. And then the second thing that we can also show is that it's fine to just look at deterministic policies. So meaning policies that map directly from a state to an action. So meaning that we don't need to, let's say, have a distribution of our actions the way that I've, I've written in the previous slide. And so that's going to help us a lot to reduce that search space in a way. And in order to avoid uh, enumerating all the policies, then we're going to use a recursive property, basically based on Bellman's uh, principle of optimality. Um, and so that, that Bellman's principle of optimality, this is, uh, if you've taken classes in CS, this is exactly the same principle you would, would have seen in, in dynamic programming. So all that time, like studying for programming interviews was not wasted time. 
it's actually the same same concept. And uh, in fact, uh, myself, uh, the more comfortable I became with MVPs, the more comfortable I also became at solving these uh, CS puzzle questions because now I can think of them in terms of MVP. And once it's written down in terms of an MVP, the solution is very simple. So- Alouette, could you remind us what a MVP is? The market decision process. Thank you. <clears throat> so just a reminder of that uh, Bellman principle of optimality, uh, if you remember, uh, so what that, that statement basically says, so this is just me uh, rephrasing it. Uh, it basically says that if a policy is optimal at a given state in time, then it also needs to be optimal in the subsequent state. So there's that recursive property about optimality. If it's, if it's optimal in the next step, then it's also going to be optimal. And uh, if it's optimal in the current step, then it's also going to be optimal in the next step. So this is also the basis for, let's say, uh, a shortest path algorithm, Dijkstra and all of that, the same principle at play. And underneath all of that is, is uh, there is a structure of an MVP uh, in and there. That being said, let's just uh, put a little note here. Uh, most of these problems in CS that we deal with are typically finite horizon MVPs. And in that setting, um, the uh, existence of stationary uh, policies is, is no longer the case. So we would have to deal with non-stationary policies, namely policies that depend on the current stage. Now, an important thing about this uh, principle of optimality is that it gives rise to a set of uh, nonlinear equations, which we call the Bellman optimality equation, which are uh, written here. And so you see that there's a max in there and that max actually has a, a big consequence in, in that it, it defines uh, nonlinear equations. And nonlinear equations in general cannot be solved in closed form the way that we did for policy evaluation up here. So how are we going to solve this then? <clears throat> well, if you dealt with nonlinear equations in, in, previously, you uh, might have seen a couple of, of techniques. And, and uh, one of them is uh, Newton's method, which we're going to see in the next slide. Or another one is uh, if you have a fixed point operator, then you can use also the method of successive approximation to find a solution to your nonlinear equation. So if we apply the idea of uh, successive approximation to the Bellman optimality equations from the previous slide, then we can show that we can find um, the um, optimal value function as a fixed point of the so-called Bellman optimality operator up there. So this operator, MathCal uh, T, if you were to write it in LaTeX, uh, is uh, an operator that takes an arbitrary vector and then computes this max over there. So if you're not familiar with, um, with operators, let me make this a bit more concrete. So I think uh, when I started that, that term like operator was thrown around uh, a lot to me and uh, I was a CS student, so I hadn't really seen these tools previously. Um, and the way that it clicked to me what, what these terms meant is really to, to think of it in terms of uh, programming concepts. Uh, so I'll, I'll get to this in a second, but I just wanted to show you here in the demo that this is just a simple application of the, the this um, idea of like what it means to, to have a, 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 an optimal value function in terms of just listing out all of the possible policies and computing the corresponding uh, value function. So this is what I'm doing here. Remember, we have two states, two actions, so we only have four possible uh, policies, deterministic policies, uh, stationary ones too. I'm just listing them all here. And then I can then compute uh, the corresponding value function for all of them. <clears throat> and so by inspection, you can see that the first policy over there would be the one which gives us um, the, uh, which would be optimal because it's larger than all of the other value functions which I've stacked as a uh, rows here. Um, and then, so the first policy here is the, would be uh, an optimal policy. So this policy in particular is the one that picks um, action zero and state zero and action zero and state one. 
Okay. So let's now just convince ourselves that this idea of applying the successive approximation method is sound. And I had just started telling you like what, what this uh, meant, uh, this operator. So this operator, you think of it as a function that takes a function and produces a new function. So uh, literally that's what I'm doing here. I create this uh, little closure function, which is uh, I call Bellman operator. And what Bellman operator does, it takes a vector, computes that mapping and then returns a new vector. Um, so it's not quite like exactly equivalent in terms of functional programming. We'd have to like pass a function, return a function. If you're at pass a vector, return a vector, but it's pretty close to, 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 to the same thing, right? So that's all it means. This is the Bellman operator. And then the, what the method of successive approximation consists of is the, you start with a guess on your solution, then you keep on applying the operator. And then if your operator is a so-called contraction mapping, you can show that the contraction um, that you're going to be able to find a unique, uh, there will be a unique solution and you're going to be able to find it as a result of applying that successive approximation method. So you start with a guess, feed it in the Bellman operator that gives you another uh, vector and you keep on repeating, put it as input output uh, until, until convergence. So here I'm just running it for uh, 50 iterations, but if you remember from our example, um, this was a value function associated with an optimal policy. So by the way, the, there could be multiple optimal policies, but there exists only a one single unique uh, optimal value function. So this is something like 0 0.16 and 1.89 and basically where that thing is going. If you were to just let, let it run a little bit more, you'd approach it. Um, all right. So the idea of applying the um, uh, Bellman operator and combine that with successive approximation in, uh, in dynamic programming in RL, we call that value iteration. But it's good to know that there's a more general pattern behind this. And just as a side note, uh, instead of using a max here, you might also want to use a smooth, uh, a soft maximum, aka, uh, AKA like a log sum x, for example. And the reason you would want to do this, I think we'll get to this towards the end of the tutorial, is that in some cases, uh, it's useful to guarantee some uh, differentiable property. And it's one way in which you can, you can ensure that. So this is something that was introduced in Rust 1988, but it's been rediscovered also in the context of inverse RL and more recently in the context of uh, soft queue learning. So simple thing, you take the Bellman optimality operator and then replace the max uh, with a log sum x and replace the arg max with a uh, soft max. Okay, so the first approach for solving that nonlinear non -linear equation was to use the method of successive approximation, but another really commonly used uh, tool uh, in solving nonlinear equation is to use Newton's method. So it can be shown, and that was shown by Pruderman and uh, Brumel in 1979, that um, Basically, applying Newton's method here to our problem is equivalent to an algorithm that we call policy iteration. Uh, and a side note here, Puderman uh, is, um, is a Canadian uh, researcher who's from the OR community and uh, made a very important contribution in the field. Uh, he's got a textbook, which I've read uh, many, many times and is always a reference that I prob probably read almost almost every week. <laughs> so Puderman 94, um, so a researcher at uh, UBC in uh, Brumel. And I think that result as well was probably um, uh, described while uh, Puderman and Brumel were at, uh, at UBC. Um, and so Newton's method corresponds to policy iteration. And what that policy iteration algorithm is, is now instead we're gonna start with a guess on uh, an optimal policy. We're gonna compute its value function. And then we're gonna improve locally that uh, policy by computing uh, this uh, arg max over there based on our current guess of the value on, on the actual value function of that policy. And then we're going to keep on alternating these two steps. So let's check and see what that looks like in terms of code. So now instead our, our uh, the, the, the body of our for loop is uh, 
consists of two lines. First line, we call our policy evaluation method. And then the second line, we simply take that VPI that we've computed for our current policy. And then we compute uh, the uh, new improved policy by taking the Rmax. Sometimes in RL, we call that step the greedification step because uh, the policy that we get out of this value function is greedy. It's greedy with respect to the choice of action. But of course, it's not greedy with respect to the immediate reward function, but it's greedy with respect to, to its values. So let's run this. And um, we see that conversion much faster. And maybe it's not surprising when you think of this because this is essentially a second order method in a sense that it looks like it's pretty much like the Newton method. So policy iteration is also a pretty efficient algorithm, tiny bit more expensive though, because we need to do a policy evaluation at um, potentially every step. Any question here? Uh, I would actually have a question. Um, yeah. Here we see that the value function is not changing, but the policy is since it has not reached the, the, the terminus, right? That's right. So the termination criteria for uh, uh, for policy iteration is uh, you can show that it's finite in the, the discrete case. Um, whenever you're going to encounter the same policy twice, it's going to mean that you 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 convert. You can stop. You can stop uh, policy iteration once you found the same policy twice. In practice, is it important to find the optimal policy, or just finding the optimal value function is sufficient? So. Uh, so you get both at the same time, right? Because you you compute the value the value function corresponding to your policy, and then you output the policy at the same time. So you get both at the same time. Now, okay. if the question is regarding the termination criteria, um, there exists a lot of criteria to to stop, um, especially for value iteration. I've I've kind of implied in the previous slide that you do this process for uh, until you know infinity, but actually there are bounds that allows us to better control when we stop. And these bounds are very much used uh, in, in OR. That being said, they're not like really thought that much when uh, you read RL textbooks and you come more from the CS side of things. So it's also good to know that uh, there are good bounds that you can use to, to, to make your algorithm more efficient and terminate uh, appropriately. Interesting. Yeah, please ask me a question because uh, uh, I'm, I'm kind of losing my voice. So it's good if- Yeah, <laughs> sure. Uh, okay. By the way, Pierre-Luc, uh, we're going to yeah. be coming up to the, the, the break in about 15 minutes. So uh, if you find a natural sort of stopping point or if you just yeah. want to have a glass of water, uh, just tell us. Sounds good. I think, um, I think the logical uh, break point is going to be after this section on approximate dynamic programming. Okay. So the, the next logical extension to what we've seen uh, which, by the way, we would refer to as dynamic programming, uh, typically in reinforcement learning, is approximate dynamic programming. So as you have seen uh, in the previous slide, in a way, like you, re you require a lot of knowledge about your system. You need to be able to know what's the transition matrix, what the reward function. And uh, if you're dealing with very large system, you might have also a very large number of actions and very large numbers of, of states. So, uh, Approximate dynamic programming is really about trying to address uh, the problem of dealing with large set of states and actions. And also, uh, it also deals with the fact that when, um, when there are cases where all you would have access to would be, let's say, samples of the MDP. And that could be for two reasons. Could be that uh, you just don't know the MDP or, uh, but, or that the MDP is so large that there's actually no way to express it uh, attractively in terms of, uh, let's say, a, a multi-dimensional array in your computer. So this is a, a paradigm that allows us to, to, to deal with this, these uh, issues. And uh, the issue of not knowing, um, not knowing the true like P or R and only working from sample is often referred to as simulation-based uh, approximate dynamic programming. Um, and this is a terminology that you would encounter when you read the textbooks from the OR side, but not, uh, not the RL side. And maybe the reason is that in RL, we like to pretend that what we do that is, is applying RL to the real world in a way, right? When, when, we, when we apply our algorithms in our environment, we just pretend that uh, it's not necessarily a simulator, but that we're just mimicking the real life. And so there's less of that notion of a simulator 
but if you if you take the more pragmatic point of view on, on what these methods are doing and, and put your um, uh, your your OR hat, then you would call that a simulation based AGP. So what we're going to do here is instead we're going to be parametrizing the value function and we're going to be trying to find um, uh, an approximation to the value function. So let's say we're doing linear function approximation. What it means is we're going to be interested in finding a set of weights w such that when I take the inner product of a feature vector phi in w that this thing's going to be close to the true value. And then you can cast that as a uh, essentially least square problem where you want to minimize the uh, weighted L2 uh, norm between your uh, approximate value function V hat and the true value function uh, V pi. And please um, keep in mind here that what we're doing is uh, policy evaluation. We're not trying to find an optimal policy here in the next few slides. We're trying just, we're just saying, you pick a policy, pick your favorite policy pi. And then our goal is to compute its value function but uh, in this case, we're going to be doing it without knowing the model. So it's going to be model-free uh, reinforcement learning. And what makes this problem hard, because uh, you might see this, this argument of a daring, like, well, this is just linear regression. So where's the issue? Well, the problem is that vpi, we don't know that vpi. This is the thing we're trying to estimate. And so uh, as opposed to a typical linear regression setup, we don't have access to the true target. We don't have access to the labels. And so we have, a, have to come up with a way of kind of creating our own labels. And then similarly also, we can't form that matrix big phi, which would be just kind of a conceptual matrix of the number of states times the number of, of uh, features, which is way too large to fit in memory. So we need to come up with a solution to that. So that solution is gonna be based on a uh, generalization of what I uh, like to call the, the policy evaluation equations. So this is usually called the projected Bellman equations, um, but I actually prefer to call that the projected policy evaluation equations. The reason is if you see the expression Bellman equations outside of RL, uh, it always refers to the optimality equation, not the ones uh, associated with value function approximation. And so nevertheless, uh, uh, let's call that projected Bellman equation. So the difference here is that we have this projection operator big pi here in terms of um, this other uh, linear term over there. And so we're trying to find a solution V hat pi such that, uh, such that these two sides are, are equal to each other. And this is a linear problem, by the way. So if we set, were to set uh, big pi to identity, then would fall back to just a simple a policy evaluation case, which is just an iterative algorithm for finding the value uh, function associated with the policy uh, when, you, uh, when you know everything. So from an, an, an operator theoretic point of view, uh, this projected Bellman equations can also be seen uh, as the composition of two operators, one of them being a big pi here, a projection operator, and the policy evaluation operator uh, Matcal uh, T. So it's useful to visualize these things uh, geometrically. And this is a picture you might have seen uh, already. So here we just presume that let's say uh, the space of value function that we can uh, represent is that plane over there. So this is the set of uh, uh, basically all possible uh, weight vector W. And this would be the, the space that it spans. And then uh, what we do is whenever we apply our policy evaluation operator, uh, that brings us to a point which may not be representable in, in, in the space, uh, that plane over there. And so what the projected Bellman equation uh, operator does is that it projects this point back onto the representable space here. So this is the composition big pi uh, mat cal t and this is the new point over there. Now on the side here, I've, I drew, uh, I imagine that the, the true value function would lie uh, outside of that space. And then this would be its um, orthogonal projection in the representable space. Now, everything on this picture kind of um, assumes uh, uh, that things are orthogonal and it's really, 
a picture that would you visualize in normal uh, Euclidean space, but it's a bit more subtle than that because actually what's going on, and I think this picture is a bit misleading when you see it uh, for the first time, because what's going on is in fact that this big pi, and I'll show you details in the next slide, that big pi corresponds to an oblique projection. And um, it's an oblique projection is just a generalization of an orthogonal projection. Uh, which is defined by a pair of two subspaces uh, where one subspace defines a plane uh, to which our projection is orthogonal to. So this is the little square here, so showing that this vector is orthogonal to that uh, plane here. And then we have the usual orthogonal projection. So what, uh, what we're doing in the policy evaluation uh, projected Bellman equations, pardon me, is a more akin to applying an oblique projection. And as you can see, uh, depending on the angle of that plane, uh, we may uh, get further away from, from the true orthogonal projection. And for that reason, uh, there's gonna be some bias introduced depending on the kind of oblique projection that we compute. So let's be more precise about the form of this projection, the form of big pi. So we can show that the so-called class of LSTD lambda, which is a, a, an approach to approximate dynamic programming, the solution to this algorithm is, uh, can be found as the solution to the linear system where we have matrix A lambda and B lambda, which are of this form. And I think that um, what's useful to see is to just pretend, let's say, that lambda is equal to 1. Because by the way, lambda is going to vary from 0 to 1. So let's think about setting lambda is equal to 1. Then you see that the, in matrix A, uh, the first two terms will cancel out. So it's going to be identity. And then it means that the solution is going to be of this form over there. And this is essentially a hat matrix. If you remember from linear regression, ordinarily square, this is what the hat matrix would be but where uh, v, pi, v pi would be given. So this would be, let's say, your target, and this is how you do linear regression, typically. Except that here it's weighted, and that z term uh, is a diagonal matrix, which contains the uh, stationary uh, probabilities for the current policy pi. And this is very important that it, it matches the distribution of pi, namely that it's on policy. Because if it's off policy, then that matrix A inverse may not exist. So, so this was more the- yeah, Luc, uh, could I interrupt? Uh, we yeah. have a question from uh, Chris who asks, uh, is that uh, oblique because the basis functions are not orthogonal to each other? No, it's oblique because uh, we introduced these additional terms over there and I'll get to this maybe in the next slide. But this term here uh, is, um, is connected to uh, the so-called LGB traces, eligibility traces in reinforcement learning. And um, essentially, we're defining an oblique projection instead of an orthogonal one. And uh, you can also think of this in terms of um, matrix preconditioning. So what's going to happen, too, as you set lambda is equal to 1, um, you're also going to increase the convergence rate. So it's going to be faster, but it comes also at a cost, which is which is variance, and we'll see that uh, I guess in the next slide. Thank you. Does that answer your question? I assume it does. <laughs> so this was the analytical point of view on LSTD, but of course LSTD is a, a model-free approach, so we're not going to be computing these matrices. We don't know p, right? So we don't know we can't express big five. So uh, we can show, and and that I'm going to be a bit hand wavy here. But the, the gist of it is you can see these matrices, turn them into expectation, and then basically estimate all these terms from data. So you sample a long trajectory of n uh, samples, and you compute these, um, these matrices. So this is going to be an outer product. So you'll get a, a, a matrix and a vector. And that z term here is a, a so-called eligibility trace. Uh, and the eligibility tr trace is really a it's really like a, an AI slash psychology slash neural concept. Um, as far as I know, it's, um, it's due to Sutton, 
uh, who himself was uh, very much influenced by the work of um, Harry Toth in 1972 uh, on, on the hedonistic neuron. So these eligibility traces were introduced as a way to model the decaying effect of memory in neurons. <clears throat> and I think uh, this is my own historical interpretation that uh, Sutton and Bartle in the 80s were interested in bringing up these things more in terms of modeling uh, tools. And just later on, <laughs> that beautiful collection, uh, connection to oblique projection and, and then the, all the properties that, that, that it brings were, were understood much later on. So it was not a choice that was made like uh, on purpose, all these connections and, and interpretations were, were added later on. And in fact, the oblique view is something relatively new that has been uh, introduced by uh, Bertsikis in, in, in around maybe 2010. So this LG trace uh, can be defined in this way in an offline manner, but also it lends itself to this very nice recursive online uh, implementation, which uh, was more the basis of what uh, Stefan and uh, Bartol did uh, back then. So this algorithm called uh, LSTD Lambda was introduced by Radke and Bartol in 96, and then studied by Boyan, extended by Vertikis, and, uh, and then studied again by Jamie Ru uh, in 2010. So it's a pretty efficient algorithm, one which is uh, quite popular on the OR, OR side, but a little bit less in the uh, AI slash CS uh, uh, reinforcement learning uh, side because um, it's you need to be forming these matrices over there. And depending on which camp you are, this may not be something you want to do because it involves um, it involves uh, n, 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 n square um, operations plus you need to be solving a uh, linear system here which if you use, let's say, uh, a direct method would be uh, order and, um, and cube. So because of computation cost and a little bit more memory, um, this might not be desirable. And so the alternative that is often uh, used in the RL side, AI side of things is to use so-called temporal difference learning, which was introduced by Sutton in the 80s as well. So his thesis was in 84, and then there is this uh, 1988 uh, journal paper on, on CD. So temporal difference learning, uh, very high level, can be seen as a stochastic approximation of approach to policy evaluation. And by, by uh, casting this as a stochastic approximation algorithm, what it buys us is that now we have linear time complexity in memory. But also a drawback, uh, and this was studied a bit uh, more carefully by uh, Jenny Wu, I presume in 2010, uh, is also it tends to be less uh, sample efficient, but we gain a lot in terms of, of speed. So what we do instead is that we uh, form a sequence of iterates where, uh, uh, same as usual, we parameterize your value function by a set of weights. And for generality here, I assume that the value function might also be parameterized uh, by a nonlinear function approximator, for example, a neural net. And what he does is that it computes this so-called TD error, which is kind of creating a fake target for, for the target that we don't have because we're not doing supervised learning. So it's creating this guess and it's making a guess from a guess. So it takes the current reward, uh, the current reward you got, then it adds the, the estimated return from the next state minus its previous guess. And this defines a scalar, which we call the TD error. Then we multiply the gradients with respect to our weights of the uh, value function, and we modulate that by the TD error. So if uh, we use linear function approximator, um, then, um, then this derivative is simply uh, the, the feature vector. And this algorithm here is called TD0. It's called TD0 because the zero parameter here refers to the lambda parameter, and the same way that we have eligibility eligibility traces in LSTD. We also have eligibility traces in temporal difference learning. Now the catch here is that if you use nonlinear function approximation, um, this algorithm may not converge. And you can find a counterexample in this um, paper by Tsitsitis and uh, Benjamin Van Roy in 1997 that uh, shows this um, uh, very uh, neatly. 
And if you're interested in the mathematical details, let's just tell you that the big picture is that um, this function composition big pi, uh, big pi times mat cal is such that uh, is such that we have a non-expansion and the non-expensive property may not be guaranteed when you have nonlinear function approximation. Nevertheless, uh, it's been used quite a bunch, nonlinear function approximation, and actually way earlier than we think. So DPRL is in a way uh, been studied a while ago, starting from, um, from uh, Tesoro in 1992, which is often credited for being able to show for first time that uh, TD could be used at scale with nonlinear function approximation. That was in the game, the backgammon game. And so what uh, Tesoro did is use neural net to learn the uh, values. So in particular, the state action value function. So this is just the expected return, but conditioned on the state in action. Um, and then in order to find an optimal policy, so here we're not no longer just in the policy evaluation regime, but in, in the problem setting where we also want to find an optimal policy. And so um, in order to get an optimal policy in that kind of scheme, what you do is that you keep on changing your, your policy slowly by, by, by doing differing, by injecting a little bit of noise and wiggling around. So uh, that, that wiggling is achieved by having an ESOF policy. And what that means, for example, is you can pick a Boltzmann policy with temperature tau, and then you feed the cure, current Q values in there, and then you sample actu actions according to this. So you're kind of sampling around your current uh, action, so you're not totally greedy. And then that kind of exploration mechanism is what allows this algorithm to, to work. So this is called nonlinear uh, SARSA. But the, the gist of it is that it's simply applying the TD rule, but now to estimate uh, state action values and then doing that dittering, that wiggling around Q to find an optimal policy. Yeah, Luke, do you think now would be a good time for a break? Um, let's, let's me say this one thing sure. and I think we'll be good. So the, in that, the related algorithm to SARSA in the nonlinear case as well is called Q learning is the one that you might have heard the most about. So Q learning is also a stochastic approximation algorithm uh, that allows us to find a solution, an approximate solution to the Bellman optimality operator. And I keep mentioning these stochastic approximation algorithms, but what they are really a stochastic approximation algorithms, they're algorithms that allows us to find zeros of a function, but only from samples. And that's why actually these algorithms are possible in RL, right? We had the, the, the template for, for stochastic approximation comes from Robbins Monroe in the 50s. And what the zero problem is here is that we want to have the two sides of the Bellman optimality equation to be equal to each other. So we can, we can write it as zero. So when you apply stochastic approximation to this problem, you get an algorithm called uh, Q-learning, which is very much like the unpack it. It is, it is temporal difference learning at the core of it. But instead here, we form an update target in a different way. And we have this max operator in there. And what's special about this algorithm is that the max over A, uh, this A that you pick here, the maximum might not be the A that you actually use in practice. So it's an algorithm that is off policy. It allows you to learn about a behavior which is not the one you're currently following. And this is in contrast with SARSA. So we'll, uh, we'll just stop here. And then uh, once we return, We'll continue with this, see how it connects with fitted value methods. And then we're gonna talk about policy gradient methods. I'm gonna say a few things about uh, optimal control and model based RL, and that should be it. Uh, great, so uh, everybody will be taking a 15 minute break. So since it's 2.35 Eastern, we'll come back at uh, uh, 2.50 Eastern, so in 15 minutes. Take care. Uh, I don't hear you. You might be on mute at the moment. Yeah. There we go. Um, everybody, we're, we're going to start back up again. We're going until four o'clock today, um, unless uh, Pierre Luc finishes early. Um, again, if you have any questions you ask, uh, you want to ask, you can uh, ask them in the Zoom uh, chat function, uh, or in French it says uh, "converser." Uh, you can ask them on the Slack channel as well in the channel for this uh, tutorial. Um, before we start again, I've, uh, I have a couple of people who have asked if your CoLab notebook will be available online, Kjeldur. Uh, 
Yeah, that was the, the goal. I just uh, didn't have time to fix the chat. I can try to do it right now if you give me one second. Yeah, sure. Uh, pull up here. And I had. Uh, I want to go into the view. I think this is good. Send so if you can zoom. copy that into the chat. In the Zoom, yeah, in group chat. Perfect. And I'll, uh, I'll copy that in the, uh, the Slack channel as well. Yeah, can someone try to just open it, see if uh, the permissions are correct? Sure, I'll try. Sounds <clears throat> good? Yep. All right. So you can go ahead and start. Yeah, so I think there might be one more thing in the notebook, but um, um, it's mostly done for now. There would have been so many things I would have liked to <laughs> demo for you, but I think we would have needed like a day or so. Unfortunately, I had to, to stop there. Um, I have more notebooks that I might be able to share later on. Um, if you follow me on my Twitter or something, or maybe on my webpage, because a lot of these uh, slides and examples were taken from my class that I'm um, offering at Mila, University of Montreal. So. Um, yeah. <laughs> Great. I'll, I'll post your, uh, is it okay if, with you if I post your personal website on our Slack channel? Absolutely. Great. All right. So just before the break, we, uh, I said, um, I talked about queue learning and we just looked at this update rule over there. Um, so this is like an update rule that looks pretty much like TD, except that, um, Technically speaking, what happen what's happening now is that our Markov chain is over state action pairs instead of only states. But that's just the same thing. Second thing we're doing is that we've had we've substituted this max operator in there. Oh. And by doing this, uh, now we have an algorithm that is trying to find the optimal value function, the optimal state action value function from which we can derive uh, an optimal policy. And the interesting thing about this algorithm is it, it, it's inherently a policy. So I think someone would have to mute their mic. Uh, Gabriel, you can just have a look. Yeah, I'm looking for it. This max operator in there. Oh. And by doing this, uh, now we have the algorithm that is trying to. Thank you. Um, so it's an off policy learning, meaning that the actions that are uh, chosen in that max over there may not be the actions that you actually uh, experience in your uh, sampling process. So this is a good feature. It means that it's more robust and you can, uh, you can choose a different policy. So you might have seen this algorithm uh, in a deep learning setting. And um, it's often introduced by saying that basically through learning is minimizing the L2 some L2 distance somewhere. So it's like an L2 loss. It is true, but I would like to just make a point here that once again, uh, these algorithms, these temporal difference learning algorithms are not stochastic gradient algorithm. Even though you might be using some gradients and you might be using TensorFlow to implement this, the resulting algorithm is not following the descent direction that would correspond to the, the true gradient, which we don't have access to. And the reason why uh, uh, we're tempted into thinking that it's only uh, doing L2 uh, minimization, some sort of regression problem, is that you can express the update rule of Q-learning uh, by coding up uh, an L2 loss in your framework. Because if you have a function of the form uh, some scalar minus a function B of W, and you take the gradient with respect to W, then you get A minus B, times uh, the gradient uh, of V with respect to W. And that's essentially the, the form that we have up there. So you might, have think, you might think, well, this is just L2. Um, this is just a typical supervised learning setup, but not quite. Um, and the reason is that this A term is not just a constant. It's a function that depends on W. So if you do that naively, uh, and you take a gradient, then it's not true. You're going to get this update rule. So what you would do usually when you implement these things is to put some sort of stop gradient around A so that you don't take the gradient in A and you view A as, as a constant and not a function. And why that problem uh, occurs, once again, is because unless, uh, unlike supervised learning, the target itself depends on the weights. 
because we're making a guess about a guess. This is what we call bootstrapping in reinforcement learning. So if there's something that uh, you should maybe remember out of this tutorial is that value-based methods like uh, temporal difference learning are not stochastic graded descent algorithm. Now, you might see uh, this update tool of Q-learning as basically um, a, an extreme approach on the stochastic approximation spectrum within the family of so-called fitted value methods, which were introduced by Jeff Gordon in uh, 1995, where what we're trying to do once again is to kind of balance out the two sides of the, the Bellman optimality equation. But now we view this really much more like a supervised learning problem, but where we're trying to balance out the two sides by, by taking a loss, which is now the L2 between the two sides of the, uh, the operator and by uh, uh, basically minimizing over this expectation where the, the distribution is over state action pair under the distribution of samples that you that are that is generated by your uh, current policy. So if I were to give you a fixed W uh, bar, uh, that would amount to just a regression problem. And uh, if you have a regression problem of that form, you might uh, apply a bunch of different tools, especially if you're if you were born before <laughs> uh, the deep learning um, the deep learning uh, revolution, let's put this way, of the last year. Uh, you might have thrown mm -hmm. some other function approximators uh, other than neural net. And in particular, this, this approach, um, uh, the fitted value methods in which you use uh, extremely randomized trees is uh, an approach that was introduced by Damien Ernst in 2005 called uh, fitted Q iteration. And it's been a pretty successful approach and one that still works pretty well. I would actually advise you to try it out as well uh, beside your neural network. So. What we do, we just fit like a, an extremely randomized tree. You can use scikit-learn to that to do that, or in fact, any linear regression—not uh, linear, but any regression prob, uh, met method in, let's say, scikit-learn to minimize uh, this this kind of loss over there, uh, which is which is a proxy for finding uh, an approximate Bellman optimality operator. Now, if you do that, that, that minimization here and where you use Q, where Q is represented as a neural network um, and you use stochastic gradient descent to minimize that loss, that gives you an algorithm called neural fitted Q iteration uh, introduced by Martin Red Miller in 2009. And interestingly, um, as we'll see in the next slide, fitted Q, neural fitted Q iteration is really the precursor to DQM. Um, and the advantage with this class of fitted, view, fitted value methods is that they're inherently offline um, and they lend themselves very well to dealing with, with batch data. So if you can't gather uh, data interactively, which is typical of healthcare application, uh, education applications and tutoring systems, or, uh, or when let's say you're trying to design a policy that you, you don't want to deploy. Can you still hear me? Yep. Yes, so I think I hit some cables just a second. Right. Okay. I'm back. Can you hear me? Yep. All right. So neural fitted Q iteration is really the precursor to, to DQN um, in 2015 at uh, Google DeepMind. So, so what DQN is essentially is a fitted Q, a fitted value method. So it's neural fitted Q iteration where you use stochastic gradient descent instead of batch gradient descent. And in which you, uh, instead of taking only one fix data set of samples, you keep on gathering new samples interactively. So it means that you get new policy, get new fresh data, and then keep on refitting your, um, your Bellman operator. And so the reuse of samples uh, is called uh, experience replay. And it's due to Lynn in uh, 1993. And, um, and that's pretty much it. And in fact, the, the, this concept of target network in DQN is nothing but uh, this uh, W bar in this uh, expression for fitted value methods. So it's uh, an old idea, but one that was executed very well. And, um, and DQN spurred a lot of interest in, in the combination of deep neural networks with reinforcement learning. So uh, it's been an important milestone in, um, 
in the field, despite uh, that the ingredients were pretty much there uh, already, but they've been combined in a way that uh, had uh, led to some uh, impressive results for, for, for that time. Okay, so all the methods we've seen so far to find policies are based on deriving uh, an estimate of the two, two values for, for a policy and then improving that uh, policy based on or value function. There's another class of method, which I very much like that we commonly refer to as policy grading methods in reinforcement learning. And uh, the idea is that instead of trying to find an approximate solution to the Bellman optimality operator, what we're gonna do is that we're gonna be parametrizing the policy directly. And then we're, we're gonna be trying to adjust the parameters of our policy such that it uh, maximizes the uh, given objective. And as usual, uh, we're going to work with the discounted, infinite discounted, um, infinite horizon discounted case. So this is the expression over there, J of theta. This is our objective. And um, here it's not conditional in any state because we assume that there is an initial distribution of our states. And I wrote uh, expectation sub theta to highlight the fact that uh, the dependence on theta is through the distribution of samples that is uh, generated by our current uh, set of parameters. Uh, Pierre-Luc, can I interrupt yeah. a second? Yeah. Uh, Chris Drummond would like to, to uh, ask, uh, doesn't the past data become progressively less useful as you train? In the experience replay buffer in D2M? Yes. Yeah, so there's been uh, various uh, add-ons that were developed based on this. Uh, one uh, follow-up on D2M that was pretty successful was called the, experience, the prioritized experience replay in which um, uh, data that's basically more relevant to you is replayed more often. So there's that weighting mechanism. So it's a sort of uh, sort of a curriculum curriculum learning sort of. In, in a sense, a prioritization, a reweighting of the data so that more useful data gets used more often. Okay, thank so you. The intuition is right. And yeah, if you have the ability, by the way, to gather new data. And you should definitely do so. It makes a big difference, uh, at least from experience too. If you're giving a fixed batch of data, yes, in, in practice, you can keep on refitting your approximate Bellman um, operator, but uh, there, there's a limit at which like, you can extract information out of it. So if you can gather more data, then it's, it's definitely going to be useful. Sounds good. So, um, Phi sub theta, this is our notation to denote a policy parameterized by theta, and that phi has to be stochastic. This is an assumption we make uh, for differentiability reasons. The big pattern behind, uh, the big picture behind a policy gradient methods and the ingredients are really come from the deriv deriv derivative estimation, which is uh, studied a lot in simulation, in the simulation community. Now, of course, these tools in reinforcement learning have been developed independently from the results and the knowledge from the simulation community. But I'd like to give you a, a little sense of how these things connect. And that connection has been uh, acknowledged a bit more recently. And I think we have uh, a lot to gain also on, on, on learning more about uh, the tools and, and uh, the results that were uh, derived um, in that field actually from starting from the 90s, there, there's, there's a lot of knowledge about this. So the, the, the big picture and why derivative estimation is needed and why it's difficult is that we're trying to find the gradient of some objective, but that objective of, is an expectation. We can't compute that expectation tractably too, because we might not know what is the underlying distribution or because it's just too, too large. The set of all possible, uh, let's say action and state is too large. So all we want to do is take the gradient of expectation, which depends, whose distribution depends on theta, and where the stuff inside depends on theta too. And why that is, this is difficult is because the dependence here is what we call uh, a distributional dependence on theta. It's distributional because the underlying uh, probability uh, density function p sub theta depends on theta. So this is what we have uh, down here, where I just wrote the integral explicitly to highlight the fact that the distribution of samples depend on theta. And because of that, when you push the gradient in, assuming that you can do it under some technical condition, uh, uh, you can put push the gradient inside, then by the product rule of calculus, you're going to have two parts. 
the two parts, the first part is all good because we can write it back as an expectation. The problem is with the second one. And the problem here is that this is no longer an expectation, right? You see here we have P sub theta, but here there's no such thing anymore. We have now the gradient of P theta, and this thing here is no longer uh, a probability measure. And why we care about having an expectation is because we want to be using Monte Carlo integration to estimate that thing. We want to get an estimate of our gradient by just drawing sample from an expectation. Uh, because uh, otherwise, what could you do? Well, let's say if you were to know maybe P, then you could perhaps do a numerical, um, numerical integration with quadrature rules. But uh, in the problem setting that we're interested in, these things are not feasible. So the only feasible thing is to do Monte Carlo integration. So how you do this? So we're gonna transform this um, second integral into an expectation by essentially applying a change of measure, AKA important sampling. So in important sampling, what we do is essentially just reweight the terms inside the expectation so that now the density can be expressed uh, in terms of Q Q is a new density. And, um, and then we can show that the grain of J is ex exactly equivalent to this expectation that where now we draw from Q instead of P sub theta. And what we've done is that now we've re-expressed the second term fully in terms of an expectation. So this idea uh, is known as, um, uh, as the likelihood ratio estimator in the simulation community. And it's credited to uh, some uh, Russian researchers, Alexandrov and colleagues in 1968. And if you set Q of X to P theta X, then of course the first uh, term, the first uh, important sampling weight goes to one. And then um, in the second term, we get um, P theta X. Then the resulting estimator that you get, is called the score function estimator and been studied a lot by Rubenstein in the eighties. And this is the basis for the so-called reinforced estimator introduced by Williams in, reinforce, uh, in reinforcement learning in 1982. And as far as I know, this has been uh, introduced independently of the prior results from the simulation community. Uh, so you would have, if you've heard about reinforce, you've probably seen an expression involving a log term. And where is that log term coming from? Well, it simply comes from the fact that uh, when you have that ratio here of the grain of P over P, well, this is just by, by basic calculus, this is just equal to the gradient of the log of pi theta, which is equal to one over pi theta times gradient of pi theta. And that's it. So really, um, if there's something to, to, uh, to remember out of this is that the reinforced estimator at the core uh, is an application of important sampling. And the log in there, although there's a lot of emphasis that is often put uh, in tutorials or around the log bit, the log bit is just a, a, a is just, um, it's just sugar coating on an expression. It's, it's simply expressing the same thing using calculus, but uh, it's just hiding underneath what would be uh, otherwise an important sampling ratio. So if you apply the score function estimator, where H is, would be the return, X would be the trajectories, uh, and theta the parameters of your uh, policy. Then you get the so-called reinforced estimator of this form where we have the sum of the rewards, but this is now weighted by the sum, <clears throat> by the sum of all the gradients starting from the beginning up to now. And in 92, uh, Williams, uh, gave uh, the interpretation of that term over there uh, uh, in terms of a trace and the LGB trace that we discussed earlier. Uh, so it was just a reinterpretation because it's something you can update recursively. Um, but this is not exactly the form that we use nowadays because you can uh, show just by reordering the indices on the summation that this is just equal to instead a sum from T equal to zero up to big T, the end of your trajectory of the grain of the log policy times the return from that point on. See, K here starts at T, the current time step, so it's the return. The reason we prefer this expression is that the previous uh, form involves accumulating gradients on the side, which uh, for neural networks would not be a very feasible thing where we'd have to basically keep 
a second copy of our networks keep on, on updating it. Whereas this is a perfectly equivalent form, but where all we have to, to compute are um, sums over rewards. And that gradient over there need not be expressed explicitly in our code because we can code up a so-called surrogate loss such that if we take the gradient of that surrogate loss, it's going to give us the same as the stuff inside here. And that surrogate loss is simply the log uh, of your policy times uh, the return. So it's kind of a cross entropy loss, basically a weighted cross entropy loss. So this is what I'm, I'm saying here that you can just code up this, uh, this uh, surrogate uh, function. So I think these two lines should be switched actually because uh, there's no graph here. There you go. And maybe something to keep in mind again is that um, reinforce is not, the surrogate loss is just a trick to implement the right gradient. Namely that ultimately what we're doing is to maximize return. And we're not really minimizing that surrogate loss. That surrogate loss is only there to help us form a gradient estimator. And just to recap again, why we need a gradient estimator is because we have a distributional dependence on the parameter is something that would not happen in a typical supervised learning scenario where the dependence of samples does not depend on the parameters of your neural network. So this is why we don't have to care about these things usually in supervised learning when we're training deep uh, neural networks um, to predict uh, you know, labels. It's really because we have distributional parameters. Uh, if you apply reinforce just like this, you would quickly find that it has a lot of variance. So what we do oftentimes is to apply a variance reduction technique uh, known as controlled variance in the simulation community. And what a controlled variance is, is, uh, is, is this um, other random variable, which is uh, correlated with the thing you care about. And so in RL, we call that usually a baseline. This is terminology that Williams introduced in 1992. And you can show that in, in this form here, this uh, great estimator, you can introduce any function that depends on the state only. And that is not gonna introduce any uh, bias in the resulting estimator. However, it might help you reduce the variance a lot. And um, so typically what we're gonna choose for a baseline would be some estimate of the value function. Um, but there could be uh, a lot of other uh, control bias that are chosen. So I encourage you to look at the paper by Schulman in 2015 on the so-called generalized advantage estimation, um, generalized advantage estimator. So these are uh, pretty useful in practice. They work very well and it makes a big difference. So no worries if you just apply reinforce out of the box and don't get good results, uh, try with a baseline. It's going to probably change a lot of things. Um, now, if instead you start this derivation uh, in the infinite horizon case, and uh, we forget for a second about the, this, this likelihood ratio trick, you can also rederive a similar expression. And this is the result that was shown by uh, Stefan and colleagues in 1999. This is a typo here, it should be 1999, not 1992. And the result uh, basically starts from the objective where this is the close form expression for the expected um, infinite, the infinite horizon dis discounted case. And this alpha vector is just a distribution over, over initial states. So if you uh, work out analytically the gradient of this expression in closed form, you can re-express it in a way that looks like this, where we have the gradient of the policy times the Q function. And this uh, business here about one minus uh, one minus gamma has to do with the fact that this, I, this matrix identity minus gamma P pi inverse um, uh, times the uh, initial distribution does not um, define a proper probability distribution over state. So you need to do that reweighting business here of one over one minus gamma. But let's uh, not focus too much about this, but more that uh, this expression over there involves a Q function. And that Q function is something you don't know. So if you want to implement that gradient uh, estimator, then you need to, be, to maintain a Q function on the side. So the idea of uh, maintaining a Q function on the side uh, in order to get gradient estimates is the basis for the so-called uh, actor-critic architecture. I'll show you a picture in a second. 
thing I wanted to say here, and I think you have a, a Colab notebook for you, is that uh, you can actually compute the true analytical gradient in closed form with a, a tool like uh, JAX uh, that allows you to take gradient through a, a linear solver. Um, and I think this is pretty cool when you want to debug your code because you can get the true solution and then see if your gradient estimator makes sense. Um, and um, at the core of the derivation in Sutton uh, and colleagues is really the application of the implicit function theorem. So it's not written in that form, uh, but this is how I like to teach it in my course at least uh, because of the recursive structure from the policy evaluation equation you can view uh, you can view it in the framework of uh, implicit differentiation, for which I'm going to say maybe uh, one more sentence towards the end. So let's just go back to to the um, notebook, and this is the last should be the last uh, cell. So it's kind of amazing that you can use a tool like JAX, which uh, if you haven't checked this out yet, you should, it's really, really neat. So what I'm doing is literally writing down the subjective as it is written in math. So I do policy evaluation to get the value function. So this is gonna be the identity minus gamma P pi inverse times R pi. This is what get, and then I just take the dot product with the initial distribution. That's it, and then that gives me a scalar. And then I call uh, grab on this function and then let's see, well, what's happening here is I'm just plotting the iterates of gradient descent. And I know for this example that the optimal value function uh, is something like 1.027, 27, 27, 27. So kind of going the right way. Um, so grad is provided by JAX here, right? So yes. uh, for people who don't know JAX, it can, uh, basically it's like auto grad for NumPy and Python, right? Okay. Yeah, yeah, and uh, it's it's uh, you just write not normal NumPy code, but actually under the hood, it's using uh, some magic uh, XLA so that it goes faster. But yeah, it provides your grad, and then it take you can take grad through a lot of things. Um, so anyway, just to tell you that you can compute the exact policy gradient, and it's a really cool thing to do when you want to debug your code and understanding the and to better understand the the properties of your algorithm because you can always get the true solution. But of course, this is not a substitute for the derivative estimators. Let me just go back to the slide. Because we use these derivative estimation because, estimators because we don't know the P matrix and the R, R function, right? Because we're in the model P setting. So it's not a substitute, but it's good to know. And, and it's a reminder of where these uh, tools come from. So after creating architecture, you need to maintain a two function on the side. Uh, but because you need to learn two things at a time, it creates a bit of instability. And uh, this instability is actually is exactly the same kind that you have in GANs uh, because um, the underlying algorithm is basically gradient descent ascent. So you alternate between two types of optimization. Uh, so the solution to make uh, actor critic architectures converge is that you would want ideally for the critic, the Q value, to have converged before you can compute your gradient. So you can uh, simulate this by um, by running your uh, by taking more steps of the critic updates than you take steps for the actor updates, which is the policy itself. Or you can set the learning rate for the critic to be higher than the learning rate for the um, for the actor. So this is the basic result that Honda showed in, in his thesis in 2002. And uh, recently, Scott Fujimoto and uh, colleagues uh, really uh, highlighted the importance of doing this in practice. So this was the TDP. TD3 paper of uh, Fujimoto and colleagues in 2018. So it makes a big difference. Actor critics can be a bit unstable, but um, uh, in terms of picture, that, that looks like this. So we have an actor that outputs actions, goes into the environment, and using the samples of reward, you create an estimate of the value function, the Q, uh, Q of SA. And then using this, you can derive uh, gradient estimates to update your policy. So this is a, the, the picture depicting actor critic. Uh, systems. Now, the where I'm going next is to uh, tell you just a few things about temporal abstraction and reinforcement learning, which was uh, the topic that I worked on for many years during my PhD thesis. So temporal abstraction is um, 
is a form of abstraction where instead of abstracting over the features, we're trying to abstract decisions in time. And intuitively, um, I like to explain that in terms of like uh, taking the metro, let's say in, in, in Montreal, and in you take the subway. So what's great about taking a subway when it works and when there's no uh, disease is you just uh, go to the nearest metro station, sit in the metro, and then it, it brings you to whatever you want. And you don't have to worry about all the messy details of uh, navigating at the surface level. So it just brings you, it just teleports you to the place you want. So it's a form of, I, I, I like to think of this as an, an analogy for temporal abstraction, where you decompose your problem into sub-steps so as to make your life easier. And the idea of decomposing problems into smaller sub-problems sub has also been uh, studied in many different fields. In optimal control, for example, in this application for the control of a, a steel manufacturing processing plant, it's been done quite a bit, quite a bunch too in um, in uh, planning, starting from the strips uh, planners in the 70s as well. But in reinforcement learning, we typically uh, model that in the so-called options framework, uh, where a set of options, uh, the options, by the way, have nothing to do with stock options. They're just um, uh, abstractions uh, that are um, outputting new actions. And so we have a set of options like this that interacts with the environment. And then once in a while, a policy of our option chooses the next option to follow. And more specifically, what an option uh, is, it's defined as uh, three things. Uh, it has an initiation set for which the semantic is something like if you have a robot navigation domain, um, the initiation, initiation set would tell you uh, in which subset of the state space you're allowed to, to use the given option. So for example, if there's no obstacle in front, then you're allowed to pick uh, the policy which drives forward, which is the policy of an option, pi sub O. And then uh, you do that until uh, you reach a termination condition according to beta of O. So for example, that would be like you drive forward until you find a charger. And then once you've uh, met the termination condition, you pick a new option and then you repeat. So uh, in my work, uh, I've been uh, working on, uh, on learning these, uh, these options automatically. So the theory for planning with a set of options that is given to you is quite mature and we understand how that works pretty well. But the biggest uh, problem, and it's still open to today, is how to design and how to learn these options automatically. So what I've done in my work during my PhD thesis, thesis was to, to come up with a, a variant of the actor-critic architecture to learn options. And so the picture looks similar to what we had before, but now we have uh, these options in there. And more importantly, there were some details that had to be uh, taken care of in terms of the, the mark of chain structure that you have when you deal with options, uh, because the technical reason here is that uh, you no longer have a, a Markov decision process, but you have a so-called semi-Markov decision process. So you need to take care of that before you go ahead and, and apply these tools. So we applied that to Atari back then, and we were able to find uh, uh, options. So the systems would learn options on its own that were not specified by us. Uh, for example, in that game of Sequest, where it would learn uh, a, a, an option that specializes in, in uh, action sequences going up in action sequences going down, and all of that behavior was not encoded by us. It was it was found by the system itself. And then same thing here in a goal in a, in a game called uh, Breakout, um, where we're highlighting a strategy that we've uh, developed in a follow-up paper that um, allows us to come up with more meaningful option because the way it's designed, if you just try to to optimize for the the expected return. There are multiple solutions to that, actually. And some of these solutions are not the ones we expect, uh, namely that you can switch from one option to the other at every time step. So, so the lack of temporal commitment, basically, uh, is um, something we don't uh, desire in practice. And so we incorporated this regularization strategy where um, this is what we see in the middle picture, uh, where the color, color coding uh, scheme represents the choice of, uh, of option in time. So this is to compare with the first picture where there's no such regularization and uh, such, such strategy uh, helps quite a bit. So um, I'm not gonna say much more about this, but just uh, 
I just wanted to highlight the fact that um, there are frameworks to talk about temporal abstraction and hierarchical reinforcement learning. Uh, there's been quite a lot of other work uh, after Option Critic, this work over there in 2017, there's been some uh, very interesting work in hierarchical reinforcement learning that are also based on ideas from actor critic systems. Um, and uh, I encourage you to have a look at these things. But generally speaking, uh, much of hierarchical reinforcement learning and uh, temporal abstraction is still very much open. And uh, I would say that my, uh, perhaps one reason for this is that I think we still lack a uh, good understanding of what we're trying to do, perhaps. <laughs> and so very much open, but I encourage you to work on this. I think there are a bunch of um, uh, important applications that could come out of this. So that leads me to the uh, part on model-based RL. And so um, in model-based RL, so the, the algorithms we've seen so far were all model three. So we were not assuming any knowledge of the uh, matrix P or the reward function. But there's um, been a lot of interest as well in coming up with methods that are trying to find a model of the, the world and that uses that model to, to plan and to derive uh, better policies. And so uh, model-based RL, uh, I'd say as of now, is not so much of a successful technique compared to the model three techniques. There are quite cha some challenges to make it work. Um, but in other fields, especially in optimal control, this has been the, the, um, the, uh, the dominant paradigm. It's been the dominant paradigm because in these fields, there's a tradition where uh, you would spend a lot of time actually modeling your system by hand, gathering expert knowledge, and really expressing all you know about the, the domain, which is something we don't want to do usually in reinforcement learning. Um, so. So there, um, in optimal control, oftentimes this, this model-based methodology is combined in the so-called uh, model predictive control uh, framework, uh, where you're using a model to make predictions about the actions you should be taking. But because oftentimes this model is deterministic and it's imperfect, uh, you will quickly uh, realize that the world doesn't function the way that you've modeled it. And so this MPC strategy basically consist in replanning very, very, very fast so that you account for the, the, the bad predictions you've been making. So this, it looks like the typical agent interaction loop of RL, but where the agent box now has a model and then using this model, we run some sort of optimizer that outputs the next action that uh, the agent thinks it should take according to its model. The model is also update, updated as you learn, right? Uh, it depends on which uh, in which setting, but it doesn't have to. So the MPC and the MPC methodology, you would account for the model misspecification by replanning really, really fast. In some cases, depending on the, the class of solvers you use, you could be uh, re-updating it like 100 times a second, for example. Okay. So these uh, MPC controllers are very mature. Uh, it's a methodology that is very mature, that works, that has been deployed, that is actually running on space spacecrafts. That's how we we, we send you know, rockets to space, and that's how we control uh, airplanes, that's how um, chemical power plants are being controlled. So it's very mature, but of course it relies on prior knowledge to design these models. But once you've got a good model, then, then the rest, the optimization on top, these tools are very, very mature. And it works. So just to introduce uh, quickly what uh, this uh, trajectory optimization uh, methodology consists of. So I talked about MPC, but at the core of MPC, is uh, trajectory optimization. Namely, namely, we're trying to, this time we're not so much into trying to find a policy, but we're trying to, to get a full sequence of actions that we think we should take and then, uh, and then carry on with these actions. So this is the trajectory optimization problem. And in the simplest case, it's written down as a deterministic problem of the form, which looks like a lot what we've done before, uh, except that now we minimize the cost and now we're interested in finding the trajectory. This is really where the difference is, right? Our variables now are the full um, uh, open loop sequence of actions. So an open loop sequence is like, let's say you would decide that you want to do left, right, 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 left, left. Well, you just go ahead and do it irrespective of what the state actually is. And so that's why the problem here is cast in this deterministic form because we're trying to do trajectory optimization. 
And so the function f here describes the dynamics of the system. U here is the control. So usually in control theory, we use uh, the letter U instead of A uh, and uh, C because we work with a cost and uh, X is a state. So T here as usual is the horizon. And then uh, you can view the, uh, the state X T plus one itself as a variable and U as well. So when you make some assumptions about F in particular, if you assume that F is linear and that the C is quadratic, that gives you a, set, uh, a, a problem a formulation called the LQR. And the theory for LQR is very, very rich and very uh, developed because a lot of the results can be, uh, can be analyzed and um, in closed form. But of course, that methodology also applies to when M is, uh, F for me is nonlinear. And, um, and in that case, you treat this problem as a nonlinear program. And then you can throw any of your, any uh, nonlinear programming solver, SQP, um, interior point methods, uh, so on and so forth. Now, what I wanted to share with you is that it's kind of cool to see that, um, in fact, what we do when we train neural networks is exactly optimal control, optimal control in discrete time. And the connection here is you would think of, uh, let's say, the layers, to, be, to make things simple, as, as the function f here, and then the output of the layer as the state. And um, now that becomes a uh, discrete time optimal control problem. And just to make that more uh, closer to the problem setup, we have usually, instead of having a cost per layer, let's say we just have a cost at the last layer. And now if we solve that problem, so this is an, a quality constraint program, uh, program. So the typical tool here is to use the Lagrange multiplier. So we write the, the Lagrangian for this problem. So it's the, the cost here. And then we add uh, the, the residual, essentially, of the predictions times the Lagrange multiplier, lambda t. And we have one Lagrange multiplier per stage. And uh, from the standard theory in um, quality constraint programming, if we found a solution to the previous problem, um, then uh, we know that there must exist a, uh, a set of Lagrange multipliers such that when you plug your optimal solution in Lagrange multiplier and take the gradient of the Lagrangian, uh, that should be zero. So it's just the generalization of the first order stationary condition of unconstrained optimization, but for the constraint case. So let's pretend we do this, and then we solve for the gradient of the Lagrangian equal to zero, and then we solve for lambda, and we get these equations here. And these equations are special because they, uh, they are related to the so-called von Trier maximum principle which is a really fundamental tool in optimal control. Um, and um, what I want to highlight here is that this middle equation over there uh, describes how we uh, adjust, how we update our Lagrange multiplier starting from the last time step. So let's say in the neural net, the last layer. The Lagrange multiplier uh, turns out to be equivalent to what we call the adjoint variable in reverse mode automatic differentiation. Or, uh, and that equation here, lambda i, the middle one, is how we update our adjoint variable and it's called the adjoint equation. And this is exactly the computation that backprop would be carrying when you apply backprop in our neural net. And then finally, the last, last expression is just um, it's just basically um, combining that, that adjoint variable and then the chain rule. But at the core of it is the adjoint equation and the adjoint variable. This is amounts exactly to the, to the basic principle of backpropagation and reverse mode automatic differentiation. So this connection uh, was actually introduced in supervised learning by Jan Lecun in 1988. But actually, the idea was known in other fields. Uh, Lecun himself also uh, acknowledges that the connection to discrete time optimal control has been known before. Uh, but uh, usually in, in our field, whenever we talk about the connection to reverse mode AV and Lagrangian, we usually cite Lecun, but actually was used uh, and widely known in other fields, especially in, uh, in, in uh, the, the field of uh, automatic differentiation. Uh, this trick, by the way, was, was leveraged in 2016 by uh, Taylor and colleagues to train neural networks uh, without doing the typical backdrop procedure. And so by solving this equality constraint program. <clears throat>
Uh, the same idea also holds in uh, continuous time, but now instead uh, of having uh, the a discrete set of states, we now have a continuum. And now we describe the dynamics in terms of a differential equation. So this x dot of t is the time derivative of x. So it basically it describes how the state changes instead. And, um, and f can be linear, can be nonlinear. Uh, we have also a, a cost function, uh, but now instead of taking a sum, we have an integral. And uh, that's pretty much it. We're given the initial state, and now we still want to find uh, an optimal sequence of control. But here, the control itself, it, it's a control function. So that's why it's u of t. It's a control function because t is, is, is the, the, the timeline, it's real, real value. So if you basically carry the same exercise and write a, the, the continuous analog to the Lagrangian, and then set its derivative to zero, which in that case amounts to do applying the calculus of variation. It gives you the so-called Euler-Lagrange equation, which are also the basis for Contrad-Gain's maximum principle. And these equations are actually, first of all, the form is pretty much like what we have in the discrete case, but now it applies to the continuous case. And what's interesting here <clears throat> is that this uh, trick here where the lambda dot is once again the adjoint equation, but now in continuous time, now this is defining a uh, set of differential equation where uh, X is the dynamics of your system. But now you also have a differential equation for the adjoint variable. So how you solve for this usually is that you integrate X forward and that gives you X uh, state at the last time step. And then you integrate backwards your adjoint equation. And what's cool is that this is actually the basis for the so-called neural ODEs, which uh, has won the best paper award at NeurIPS in 2019. So neural ODEs uh, were about basically uh, learning uh, ODEs that are parameterized by neural nets. So where F here would be a neural net. And in order to do that efficiently, to take the gradient through an ODE, they use this, uh, this, this principle over there, which amounts to the so-called reverse mode automatic differentiation. So that's really what it is. So the point of, uh, of this uh, little detour in optimal control was to tell you that, uh, first of all, um, that there are some uh, really mature tools in, uh, in trajectory optimization to do model-based uh, planning, especially when combined with MPC methodology, but also that you can use optimal control to understand our optimization methods that we also apply just be beyond reinforcement learning that we apply in supervised learning as well. And so you can think of backdrop itself as an application of discrete time optimal control. And also more recently as uh, neural ODEs as a consequence of the Euler-Lagrange equation uh, from uh, continuous time optimal control. And where I'm very interested and excited personally is also at the interplay of, uh, of uh, optimal control in uh, learning where instead of using models that are given to us, we let's say parameterize F by a neural net and then learn it so that um, to, so that we get better performance. So to combine the advantages of of uh, learning methods with deep neural networks with the very mature techniques from optimal control, which by the way one of the advantage of optimal control is that it's very natural and easy to add constraints, which can be very useful if you have robustness or safety constraints. Something that would be quite challenging otherwise to do in the, you know, with the the typical uh, sets of uh, model free methods in reinforcement learning. So to say a few more things regarding models, and this is a bit more in the, in the typical uh, M mark of decision process uh, framework. Um, there is, I think, a lot of interest and some, there's been some really interesting ongoing work on learning models. And I would say that this is very, the, the, the challenge right now is to learn good models for, for reinforcement learning. Um, there's been some early attempts, let's say in the uh, Atari domain uh, to learn models. Um, but what has been quickly uh, found is that even with the best model, uh, the slightest error that you make really quickly compounds in the Bellman optimality equations. And then quickly uh, your planner gets off track and then there's nothing to do with this. So, so far uh, we haven't really gotten good results in model-based RL. Uh, that being said, there's been this recent uh, result by uh, by uh, DeepMind uh, with their new zero um, 
architecture, which is which is which show, shows a lot of promise in uh, better dealing with uh, with model based RL. But uh, I'm personally interested in that question as well. And the approach and the bet that I'm, I'm making is that we need to be uh, learning models that are better suited for planning that are basically coupled with with the goal of getting good policies out of them. And this is in contrast with the direct methodology in which you would, let's say, try to estimate the transition matrix or reward function by simply gathering data and doing MLE estimation out of your data. So that methodology has been attempted quite a bit, but it shows some weaknesses, especially in, in higher dimensional spaces for the reason that I mentioned that uh, sometimes we might be trying to allocate some um, uh, some some representational power to model parts of the environments that are not relevant for the thing that we care about, which is to get good policies. So uh, the line of work here that I'm, I think is very interesting and I'm, I'm pursuing with my group is inspired by the seminal work of uh, Rust in 1988. So Rust uh, is a researcher um, that um, that comes from econometrics. So it's not, not someone from RL, but his work is very, very neat and it's been a precursor to many things in reinforcement learning. So in this 1988 paper, it's called Structural Estimation of Markov Decision Processes. What Russ was interested to do was to infer a, an MDP model that would, uh, that would be able to model the behavior of a uh, of a car mechanics or someone who is fixing buses actually. And um, in order to better understand this thought process essentially. So they had access to data and they wanted to find a reward function and transition matrix such that when you would plan with it, you would get a distribution of actions and states that, that matches the data you've got in terms of log likelihood. So you can view that in terms of like, let's say a computation graph that takes the model parameters, does planning to get a, a, a Q function, derives an optimal policy out of Q, and then compute the log likelihood out of the data set. And now what, what uh, Russ was doing was essentially optimize that thing end to end, which is pretty cool when you think about it from the point of view of uh, end to end learning these days. But why this is difficult to do is that that mapping from policy parameters to optimal policy uh, goes through essentially uh, uh, a fixed point problem. So you need to be able to take a gradient through a fixed point equation. So if you want to think in terms of it as a neural net, it's as if let's say you have an infinite number of layers. So like a, an infinite RNN in a way where each layer is an application of the Bellman optimality operator. So how would you do that tractively, you know? So the, trick here in Rust, and this has been used by Rust without actually mentioning it this way, is to use what we call in machine learning implicit differentiation, where implicit differentiation is a technique based on the implicit function theorem that allows us to get some, uh, the gradient uh, uh, to, that basically tells us how is my fixed point going to change as I change my parameters and allows us to do that without having to remember anything uh, about the, the algorithm, about the process that led us to that solution. So in other words, we don't need to remember all the variables the way we have to, let's say, back propagation through time. So that's what Russ did. Now in RL, uh, in the 90s, um, we then uh, saw uh, the first uh, proposal to do inverse RL. And inverse RL, inverse reinforcement learning, is essentially uh, based on, on Russ uh, structural estimation problem. It's been acknowledged, but perhaps not known uh, well enough in our community. So inverse RL is the problem of finding a reward function from data. Uh, the problem setting of Rust is even more general in that you can, you can also estimate even a transition function indirectly from demonstration. Uh, the same idea of doing uh, inferring, let's say, a model from, from demonstration has also been the basis for the differentiable MPC work of Brandon Namos in 2018. And the trick at play here is also implicit differentiation, uh, but where, uh, but applied to the, the, the stationary condition of the Lagrangian. Now, same idea has also been uh, 
pursued by uh, Jonathan Sorg and uh, Sipinger in 2010 in their so-called optimal reward design problem. So optimal reward design, what they're trying to do here is to find a parameters of a reward function, a synthetic reward function, such that when they plan with it, derive a policy, then they get good performance. So it's the same computation graph up there, but instead of the log likelihood, it's the expected return. So it means that the last part of the, the, the pipeline here would involve a policy grain estimator. And then the rest would involve some sort of implicit differentiation approach. But back then, uh, Sorg uh, and uh, Sipinger uh, used uh, the paper by, by, um, by Geiger, Liener, and Shaba Shivas Pari on um, imitation learning, which was an attempt to basically uh, provide some conditions under which the gradient through the fixed point exists. And they had to do a bit of uh, of, uh, of math to, um, to make sure that, to prove that this result holds. The reason why they had to go through this, this effort was actually that they use the, uh, let's call it the hard Bellman optimality operator. The problem with this is the hard Bellman optimality operator is non-differentiable, it's a max. Whereas uh, Rust in ADA got around this by, by using a smooth Bellman operator. So everything was end-to-end -end differentiable. Whereas the nourish of study we had to use notions of subgradients uh, and uh, things like this. So the sword paper was based on NER, which the NER paper can be seen as an application of the implicit function theorem, uh, with the exception that it's not uh, truly differentiable because they don't use the smooth uh, development operator. Now, you don't really need to do uh, model-based planning in that part of the pipeline. You could also do model-free. You could do policy gradient. Uh, methods. There are a bunch of different choices. So it's a very general template. And uh, the reason why I think this is really cool is that I think uh, many of us uh, in reinforcement learning uh, uh, have the intuition that the models that we need to build uh, need to be just centered on the agent. They just need to reflect the needs of the agent for representing the world. And that representation ought to be uh, subjective, to use a bit of a philosophical term here, uh, in that sense that we just want our agents to model whatever they need to solve the task at hand. And in that framework, we're really kind of blending model-based and model-free. The distinction between be, becomes quite fuzzy at this point. Um, so I think this is a pretty uh, important uh, line of work that we should pursue because model-based RL has a lot of potential but hasn't been uh, leveraged very much. And I think there are lots of great tools that we could also use from optimal control. And the interplay of optimal control and reinforcement learning is uh, something that many of us are interested in. In fact, we now have a new conference even called uh, Learning for Dynamics and Control, uh, which uh, gathers people from optimal control and learning together. And I think we have a lot to learn from both, both sides in the same way that I think we have a lot to learn as well from, from the simulation community. Uh, just a little parenthesis here, this is my last slide, but um, uh, what we call the reparameterization trick in machine learning, uh, which is fairly recent, uh, is a tool that has been used all, for a long time in the simulation community. And in that community, it's known as the infinitesimal perturbation analysis um, trick. And so uh, there are a bunch of theorems, characterizations, and results uh, available for IPA that could inform us of the properties of reparameterization, which is which is very hot nowadays. So lots of things to learn as well from simulation community. So please uh, talk to your colleagues in the OR department. Uh, I think you can learn a lot from them. They can learn a lot from you. And uh, together we can come up with, uh, with uh, better, uh, better solutions. So in general, I, my uh, problem has to do with learning over a long horizon. So this is my bias, of course, here. So I think that learning over a long horizon is a key challenge across disciplines, even reinforcement learning, supervised learning. Um, and uh, I think there's a lots of great ideas to take from, from um, the constraint perspective on, on the trajectory optimization in which we basically decouple our problem into sub problems using these equality constraints. And um, that may help us uh, in fighting the vanishing gradient problem. So these are things that we're actively pursuing in my lab. Uh, generally speaking, the problem of representation learning is very much open despite the success of DQM and in the uh, Atari games, uh, 
Uh, we still have representations that are very brittle that don't allow us to deal well with changes in the environment with different tasks in a multitask regime or in a continual learning regime. And, and this is probably a problem of representation. So although we have deep learning, representation learning is still very much open. How do you get a good representation that allows your, your agent to learn fast and efficiently across the multi, multiple environments and across the changing world? So model-based RL, this is what we just, just discussed. How can we build good models that are lead to good policies, that are well adapted, that are robust? Uh, I think this is both interesting in the discrete time case as well as in the continuous time case. Now that we've, we've made the step and we've, we're, uh, we're willing to work with ODEs now in neural networks, thanks to neural ODEs, this opens uh, uh, the way to lots of new applications in which we, uh, we use a model beyond, beyond the MDT framework and where let's say we model the world by an ODE. And this is very relevant, especially these days in the context of uh, modeling diseases and the spread of diseases where it's common to model uh, these things in terms of uh, ODEs. Uh, but where of course here our contribution from the learning side is actually to come up with good uh, methods for finding these models, learning these models from data, AKA the system identification problem. And uh, finally, the class of methods from um, model free reinforcement learning, things like temporal difference learning, they're very elegant uh, because of uh, their uh, time complexity and memory. There's some, um, uh, but the problem is um, said to be quite simple and efficient, require a lot of data. So depending on which, uh, in which setting you're working on there, if you're, uh, if you're someone who's working with a small amount of data in healthcare application, this might be an issue. Uh, if you're designing algorithm with AGI in mind, that may not be an issue. So it depends a bit on what are your goals, uh, but sample efficiency is definitely something that we got to keep in mind. And um, in, in that sense, uh, there might be value as well in, in combining prior knowledge. If you're working in problem setting where you have expert knowledge about either the structure of your solution, the structure of your model, uh, these, can, these things can be incorporated and then combine also with learning. We've got some good example from, uh, from Yi Song Yu at, uh, at Caltech, especially on combining uh, ODEs with a known functional form describing the mechanics of their quadcopters with learning methods to learn residual models, for example. So um, this is a very promising work as well. And finally, I think uh, to come up with better and robust and safe RL, there might be tools to, to leverage in optimal control. It's a very natural setting for expressing uh, constraints. It can be just added literally to our NLP, to our nonlinear program, and, uh, and then we can get uh, hard, con hard constraints and safety guarantees on our solution, which is something we wouldn't be able to do easily with uh, more traditional temporal difference learning or policy gradient based methods. So with that, I think it concludes the tutorial. I'd be glad to take more questions if you have any. And uh, if there's a takeaway here is that reinforcement learning is very multidisciplinary. It's important to understand the motivations behind what people are doing in their respective field and to respect also uh, their point of view on this and to really realize that they come with, with uh, different objectives and then it shapes the kind of tools that they use. But overall, uh, we have all we have to gain from, from, from using as much and to talk to each other. Thank you. Thank you very much, Pierre-Luc. Um, it was a very interesting and very clear talk. Uh, I appreciate your uh, multidisciplinary uh, perspective on this material. Uh, really interesting. Um, I have uh, a raised hand here from Chris Drummond, who would like to uh, who would like to ask a question. So I'm going to try to unmute you, Chris. Can you go ahead? Okay, I think I've succeeded. Um, it seems to me that a lot of the problems in reinforcement learning are early in the process. So particularly if you have a very sparse reward, it takes you a long time to even discover the reward initially. But once yeah. you start to have some sort of policy, the process is, is, is faster. Uh, so that makes me think that the model I want is not a model that I want to use, but I want, I'd like a model for the early on in the process. Uh, and then I'm happy to discard the model. Once, once I know enough, then I would be happy to discard it. So it'd be interesting to talk about using a model as a bootstrapping method to get somewhere and then discarding it. 
So this is not something I've thought about, but uh, you're, you're right that uh, dealing with sparse reward is something very challenging in reinforcement learning. And as far as I know, we don't have a good theoretical grip on what it even means to have sparse reward, but we know very well and practice what it means. Let's say you only got a zero or one at the end of your trajectory. And that tends to be really hard to, to learn over. Um, in a sense, the eligibility traces mechanism is a very basic mechanism to do credit assignment using the recency heuristic. But I believe that there is much more to be done at the intersection of causal learning in particular and credit assignment in the context of reinforcement learning. Recency heuristic can be seen as a very simple uh, uh, heuristic for, for causal reasoning. So I think there's more to gain here. Regarding the discarding the model, I'm not too sure I have an opinion with this, but there, there are definitely some elements that intersects well with uh, ideas like uh, Dyna, in which we, we combine mo both um, experience from, from the real world in a model-free fashion, and we combine that with prediction from our model. Um, but the discarding, uh, that would be uh, something I'd have to take a bit more as to where it fits, but I think you're raising a good point here. Any other questions, Chris? Well, I mean, just a slight, yeah, my, the reason for discarding it was to be able to live with imperfect models. So what you said earlier on was if you have a, a model that's not perfect, that at some point in time, it, it, it's, it's more dangerous than it's helpful. Um, so, but I think often people, when people have a model, a rough model of how things work, um, and in controllers, in terms of controllers, if you, you could start with a linear model, for instance, uh, even though you didn't expect that the optimal model would be linear. Yeah, so this, uh, this, uh, the, the problem of model mystification is, is very, very real. Um, I think the, the interesting lesson from, from MTC is that even though their models might not be perfect, uh, by virtue of replining really fast, you can still account for a model imperfection. There's some great results by Baron Boots and uh, colleagues on uh, drawing connection between MPC and online learning. And they've also have great experimental results uh, showing uh, MPC with uh, neural networks on actual uh, self-driving cars that are able to drive you know, across really uh, tough, rough terrains and uh, adjust to the, uh, the uh, on-model disturbances uh, really quickly by virtue of replanning, solving their QTs really fast. Um, but uh, you're right, if you apply, um, if we just learn a model naively from a, an MLE model, then plan with it, there's that compounding error that might quickly uh, occur, and then uh, it, might, it might do more harm than, uh, than good. So, so having a fallback mechanism uh, such as what you're you're proposing might might uh, be important. Sure, thank you. Does anybody else have any questions? Um, I might have an easy one for you. You mentioned that you're specifically interested in uh, problems where uh, you have to make decisions over very long time spans. Uh, I'm just wondering, uh, are there specific problems that are like representative of that challenge for you? That, that's a problem that occurs quite quite quite, uh, quite fast. You know, on the long horizon, uh, you don't need much uh, to, to encounter the problem. It relates also very much to the credit assignment problem where you have sparse rewards, where sparse reward problems are, are quite common. It's much more, it's much easier to represent a task, to express a task in terms of whether you succeeded or not, than to craft like a reward function that assigns credit over, over each individual time step. So these, these two things are really intertwined with each other, like sparse rewards and credit assignment over a long horizon. Does anybody else have any questions? Um, well, in that case, I think I will thank our speaker again uh, for taking the time, preparing the materials. Uh, I will be, I have put up the link to the Colab notebook on the Slack channel and we will be putting it on the, uh, the web page for the program of the conference, I believe. Um, also, Pierre-Luc says uh, the, the materials on his website are also good resources for people who want to get into this stuff. Um, so that's it. Thanks a lot, Pierre-Luc. Thank you.
Yes, thank you, uh, thank you, Gabriel, for sharing the session, and thanks a lot, uh, Pierre Luc, for uh, for giving a very nice tutorial uh, this afternoon. And uh, the tutorial will be uh, will be available uh, the, as a replay on uh, on the YouTube channel for people who may have uh, missed it. So great, thank you. Bye, everybody. Have a good day. Thank